What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and I am really thrilled for today's episode. Joining us today are two incredible whistleblowers who have been on the forefront of bringing awareness to crimes against children and who have been whistleblowing their own stories and perpetrators to do so. Our first guest I'm honored to introduce to you for the first time, mother, fighter, healer, survivor, voice for the voiceless, and daughter, daughter of John Walsh, former host and creator of TV show America's Most Wanted, Megan Walsh. Megan is currently in the fight of her life to get her children back and is actively bringing awareness to CPS corruption and her parents' involvement with her case. Although America may have their own perceptions of the Walsh family from the way the media has portrayed them, Megan comes to us with a different and darker story about her family. One that involves a web of lies and corruption, including the trafficking of her own children, and unanswered questions surrounding the tragic and mysterious death of her brother, Adam Walsh. Megan comes to us today to lift the veil off the public narrative, and we ask your help in sharing her harrowing and horrific personal testimony far and wide so we can get justice for her, her children, and her brother, Adam. Helping us to corroborate Megan's story today and to add input of her own is one of my dear friends and former podcast guests, independent researcher, survivor, and authority on all things MKUltra, Penny L.A. Shepard. I encourage you all to go back and listen to Penny's incredible testimony of surviving Project Genesis and MKUltra on episode nine of season two on our YouTube channel, Spotify, or any other platforms that we're on. Ladies, thank you so much for being here with me today. Oh, Emma, thank you so much for having us today. And thank you for everything you're doing. Gosh, I know your viewers are well aware of, of what you've been experiencing and, and how things have shifted for you once, you know, getting involved and really actually be, you know, becoming very vocal about our, our cause and these different situations. So it really takes a lot of courage and I can't thank you enough for just your perseverance, your passion, really being a voice for us. Let me thank you. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. You know, it's like, I don't know how people can hear these stories and not want to take action. And part of that, I think, is because there's not other people doing it. So I'm not afraid to be the first one up and, and to do it. And I know that I'm not the only one. But I always feel like if you're standing up for something, just like how you ladies are, you eventually get people that will look at you like you're crazy, but then they start jumping on board and, and actually asking, like, why is she talking about this? Or why are so many people coming forth with these same stories? So I always look at survivors and parents and, and everybody involved with anything involving children. You're all puzzle pieces. And the more that we get this information out, the more we can build this puzzle and give us this bigger picture of what's actually happening in the world. So I'd love to start, you two are two of my favorite people. And uh, I'd love to hear the story of how you guys met and how you are uh, or ended up working together the way that you are now. Penny? <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> There was a mutual friend of ours that went, she was going to go down to see Megan and she had known that I had written something about John Walsh uh, sacrificing his child. And when they announced it to the public, it was actually on my birthday. So it was August 11th. They found him on August 10th. So I hadn't dug really deeply into the case, but I had just made a peripheral statement that I, that I believe that he was uh, in the satanic agenda and that he sacrificed his child. So she asked me, should I go down to see Megan because I'm afraid of her dad? And I said, do you love your friend? And she's like, yes. I said, then go see her and support her. And so she went down and I, I, knew, she, I knew Megan was going to be targeted. I knew that was, that was going to happen. I knew the protocol and I knew it was going to happen. And then when the friend came back, um, uh, Megan, like two months later, texted me. And I was like, why is Megan texting me? And I found out that her children had been taken and she was in jail. And so I started talking to her. And then we found out we had a lot of commonalities because I was raised in Miami. So I was born in Hollywood Memorial Hospital, August 11th, 1958. And then when we start talking, I find out Megan was born July 15th, 1982 in my hospital. And I was like, what? Because I don't even know if my, if my brothers or sisters were born in that hospital. And then we just started finding out more commonalities because I believe that her dad knows my brother very well. My brother is in the entertainment industry. He represents some very high profile individuals and shares the 
clientele of uh, Lou Taylor, which I, I, I was trying to prove like a link between the two, but then I was like, crap, they, they share the same clients. And, uh, and her dad also was, he wasn't just uh, in, you know, doing this, this um, reenactment, police reenactment programs. He also for, at one point had the John Walsh show in which he had all these different entertainers on his show. And, you know, I don't know who was booking their entertainment, but again, my brother has been in the entertainment industry for over 50 years. And uh, some of the people that he had were a little bit controversial, like um, Clone Aid was on the show. And there, so I, I had been researching Clone Aid and their registry is in the Bahamas. And I also was researching, I spoke briefly with a man named Panos Zavos. Panos Zavos, Zavos actually clones, that's his thing. That's what he does. He says he clones for purposes of reproduction. So uh, in, in the balance of things, I'm thinking he has a, a thing on Amazon called cloning the dead. And he basically said, if he had a pristine uh, DNA sample of Jesus, he could replicate Jesus. So that means Jurassic Park is true. So when we started, when we met, we started sharing information because I said, I'm in, I was born in, um, in Hollywood Memorial and I lived 13 minutes from your parents. I lived at 1255 Northeast 202 street in North Miami beach uh, high school. So and then also I'm just realizing when I'm researching uh, Joe Matthews, who was uh, the one who declared that Otis Toole was the murderer, I'm realizing that, that the entire Miami PD, um, they serviced me, my family because I, was, I, I lived in North Miami Beach. So he's on the force in 1967. I'm born in 58, I'm nine. And then I left when I was about 19. Hold on just a second. Go ahead, Megan. Megan? I didn't say anything yet. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Megan, if you want to segue into some of what you're going through, um, you're dealing with a really high profile case right now. Um, and I know Penny's been helping you bring awareness to that. And I know we've all been rallying around you and sharing okay. your story. For people not familiar with your case, could you talk a little bit about what you're going through right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think out of the whole list that you said in the beginning of, about me, I think the uh, the one that I'm most proud of is being the younger sister of of Adam Walsh and uh, and all that he's really done. Uh, you know, his story, no matter what the truth is or what the heck happened, you know, that has really uh, changed a lot in the way of good and and really brought a lot of attention to our children and missing. Uh, people and a lot more in general. So, you know, and, and again, I honor my parents uh, very much. And I understand that for a lot of people and the, and the viewers, you know, this is wild information. Uh, cognitive dissonance is real. And, uh, you know, I, I believed and honored and loved my parents for 38 years. Uh, you know, hearing the same narrative and being told the same as everybody else. So, um, you know, this is absolutely heartbreaking and, uh, and, and horrific to have to go through, um, even being forced to speak out like this. But, you know, again, truth um, is really what matters for justice. And, and, you know, no matter who it is, uh, if something is, is being done that's wrong and, and is violating or, you know, abusing or hurting others, especially, and especially children, then that needs to be addressed and, and justice needs to be served. It needs to be stopped. So I wanted to preface with that. Also, guys, I know plenty of people, uh, I've been doing interviews and I want to also say that I'm healing uh, basal cell carcinoma, skin cancer on my nose uh, with Rick Simpson oil. I encourage everyone to look into it and use it. So, you know what, I take all the hardships and, you know, we have to use them as our greatest life directors and uh, how we can really help others through our own, you know, very unique and individual experiences. So um, Rick Simpson oil, please look into it. Uh, it's great for especially skin cancer, um, but many other cancers and uh, it's being proven with protocol and, and whatnot now. So new, new strides for that. So I just wanted to address that. Um, I am rebuilding my nose back. So um, I hope that that handles that for everyone. Uh, my case. So to get to the point here, Emma, is that uh, in April of 2021, uh, my parents 
uh, started a wonderful protocol, as Penny will say, um, on April 1st, April Fool's Day. Um, I was ambushed by, um, you know, undercover, well, not undercover, street clothes, sheriffs, uh, that my dad has been working with about a year ago during the elections, our local elections, my dad supported the local sheriff that was running. Uh, and that was pretty much a guarantee. If you're around Indian River County and especially Florida, South Florida, we have the term, you know, the good old boys club. And uh, that's really what we're, you know, dealing with, you know, for people to kind of grasp somewhere to start with this. So I live in a small Masonic town. Uh, you know, my my wedding uh, picture out in front of the courthouse is in front of the Masonic symbol stamped into the cement. So for any of those who are saying, what's it, how do you, you know, prove a connection and things like that, just look into it, they're there. Um, but I am in, in a small town in Indian River County uh, my father endorsed the local sheriff, who the sheriff prior to that has quite a history that Penny's aware of, uh, you know, a lot of connections and strings going back to the cocaine cowboys in South Florida itself, uh, back in the time of my brother, Adam. Um, and, you know, all of this led up, I should say, I don't mean to skip around, but before we get into that, I should give a little preface that you know, I had been speaking up and, and you've covered this on other shows and we can do another show about this another time, but the upbringing that I've experienced, the treatment from my parents, the narcissistic abuse, the coercive control, the brainwashing, the shopping me to therapist, Munchausen, you know, calling someone the gaslighting, saying you're crazy when you're speaking up, um, forced hospitalizations and, you know, passages rehab under ultimatums. Um, it's all there in my past. I was in fashion and music. Anyone can look this up. And I left everything uh, to be a mother and to go into healing. Um, I also talk out a lot about and against new age and the new age movement and the occult because I was trained in it. I was very supported by the agencies, by industry, by the figures when I was um, 20 plus years in Eastern religion, philosophy, focusing on Hinduism, Sikhism, uh, and Kundalini even. So um, that really, I went running for the hills and I started uh, developing a family community learning farm uh, here. And that's when I really started um, you know, speaking up about the abuse, you start realizing things as you get older and as you become a mother, uh, different things like that. And, and I really wanted to be on my own and, you know, have worked since I was born essentially. Uh, so I really wanted to be on my own. So I started speaking, I was working with a therapist. Um, she actually had to stop, uh, seeing my parents because of their behavior, lack of responsibility, wouldn't show up. Um, and that's another trend as Penny can back up in, in all of this, that gaslight and again, that Hegelian dialect. But, um, and, I, and I don't mean to be long-winded or avoid the question, but I wanna give a little background as to why this happened and why this started happening on April 1st. And that was because I started speaking up about this type of abuse. I started keeping my children and I from them and you know, quietly and gracefully trying to implement things to move my life away from them and be able to support myself and my children safely. And without having it to be a big, ugly thing, especially after they had assaulted me on Thanksgiving of uh, not this past Thanksgiving, but the Thanksgiving before they uh, people have heard me in other interviews talk about the assault that took place there where my mother bit me and bloodied my nose and ripped my hair and they were trying to frame me to say that I was crazy. Uh, which horribly backfired on them. Um, and they still use this in the case and everything saying that I assaulted my mother when that's not at all the case. And I'm the one with the pictures. <laughs> yeah, Penny knows. Um, so anyways, they, I was, I was speaking up about the abuse and I started asking about, uh, when Epstein came out and different things, I started looking into my brother, Adam Walsh's case. Um, and that was a big thing, you know, the Epstein stuff and all that is, you know, we all know about that. I was just asking, thinking my dad would probably be proud of me. You know, he's the manhunter and the criminal, you know, I mean, this is what I've been raised in. I thought that, you know, hey, dad, what about 
this Epstein thing, you know, what's, what's your reaction? Is it like McCain? Did you guys all know? And there's nothing you could do about it or, you know, but, and I would just, instead of talking to me, I mean, I'm not like 12, I, you know, instead of talking to me and being like, oh, this or that, it was, oh, Meg, you know, oh, oh, what, what are you talking about? You know, oh, I don't know. And yeah, what were we going to do about it? And very evasive, very, you know, aggressive. You're crazy. You're crazy. You're that, that's crazy. Da, da, da. And then things like Laura Silsby started coming up in Haiti and connected to Amber Alert and the National Center. And me remembering that my dad had gone with nefarious players like Hank Asher uh, to Haiti on private planes and looking into that. Uh, my brother Adam's case files are all public record. So started looking into that. And that's not something that I, I'm, I'm not the first, you guys. It's been 40 years, as many people know, with a lot of controversy behind my brother's case many different stories, many botched aspects of the investigation um, itself and, and um, you know, nefarious characters within the Hollywood Police Department, Joe Matthews, Hank Asher, Ernie Allen, these behind the scenes players that, you know, we talk about, but everyone says we can't identify. Well, they're all coming to the surface. And I started looking into that and it was evident in my brother's case. And a lot of people have been talking about it. I mean, again, as Penny started, that's how we even met was people discussing my brother's case, you know? Um, so I, I started asking that in combination with, you know, them sensing that I was not going to put up with the abuse anymore and the control. Um, and so on April 1st to come full circle guys, April 1st, they had the local sheriff's department who my father's been working with and has a history with, um, he's basically running the, um, town now like a local mob boss um and he i uh, had them pull me and my children over in unmarked police cars and street clothes with i think two of them there were like six or seven i have it live i put everything on live facebook everyone could see it i'm not hiding anything again this is her, this is crazy to me does it, it does it sound crazy yes because it is that's what i like to say um and i filmed it all they the served me in Sorry to interrupt, um, but like if people are, have been following my show or they can go back in the archives and see how common this is. I've had many parents on my show saying the same crazy thing. So I ask people, mm -hmm. you're listening, ask yourself why so many parents all over the world, this isn't just America, we have the UK, we have Australia, we have every country, parents saying the same exact things are happening to their children. So just keep that in mind as Megan is talking. Thank you, Emma, because, you know, that was another aspect of why they were doing this was because I have been an advocate for uh, family court anti-corruption and CPS corruption um, prior to any of this happening. And the things that I heard from parents um, to see them horrifically like happen, you know, in my case, which I had heard people talking about months prior, my advocacy work is just terrifying. It's a nightmare, a living nightmare. Um, and it's real. Um, Penny and I also know another woman, Annette, that's been going out and doing amazing um, films. I think you know Annette as well. I'm sorry. Um, but that's been going out and doing amazing, like impromptu, uh, just stopping on the street and asking people, would you believe that CPS is really the one stealing our children and trafficking them? And I think it's just brilliant. I even put it on my Twitter last week, like everybody, if everyone here goes and just asks one person that you know, or that you don't even know, like, are you aware, would you believe this? Are you aware of this? And can I take a few minutes to just humbly, you know, explain it to you? Not rah, 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 and you know, this is happening, but really we need, and we'll get to that, the actionable thing things, but we really need people to start understanding, like giving them ways that they can help and they can act and they can support. And it really is just communication and education and getting people to go local and state, but we'll get to that. Um, so long story short, they had us ambushed. Um, they served me paperwork. They then, um, I had hearings and the, the crooked judge here in town, allegedly from what I've been told by many, um, called CPS immediately. Immediately. This is how the family court system works before even hearing any of the trial or allegations or anything in the first two seconds called uh, and had this also shows the racket, by the way, and um, and switched it to DC. I've had them listen. She judged. I, I represent myself, you guys. She, you know, ended up finding that this was not an emergency, like they said. 
Um, and we all need to remember John Walsh has been paid for 40 years to really deliver jarring and emergency and, you know, big messages that put you in shock or, you know, get you to react or get you to not even question because of the delivery and the nonverbal, you know, that's for Penny, Penny, you'll get into that stuff. But, um, but anyways, before we do, they came, we had hearings, the new judge, the DCF judge that was put under, um, my father got on a Zoom call in two seconds and said, or a Zoom hearing and said, your honor, she's holding those children hostage. We need to get them out. And in the John Walsh, you know, made for TV uh, candor. So the judge said, okay, without anything else, uh, I went to go leave my home with my children to go to my cousins to find out what was going on. I was terrified. And they had police in undercover cars waiting down the street. There was no warrant, no criminal aspects. I have no prior reporting. I'm in the community. Um, you know, if anything, I was saying they should have charged me with having my kids out too much during a pandemic. I don't know, you know, like that's, that would have at least been maybe more valid than anything they said. Um, like you'll see in protocol, they said things they were saying, the claim is a lot of people are going to wonder that I have severe untreated mental illness and that I am psychologically abusing my children. The most vague, yes, the most vague, uh, unfounded, you can make it an emergency, you know, I mean, it's, it is so bad. And today's system, you know, you can, your neighbor, I could get mad at Penny right now if she had a child with her and, you know, make a report and they could go take that child, you know, and, and any investigation, they say that they, they do, if you do complain, it's handled internally. And, you know, it, that just goes into a whole other thing. And maybe we'll do another show since this is an introductory but about how the CPS system really breaks down and how they how they do this to, to parents and people, because this is something that will affect everybody or someone that you know. I'm not going to fear monger like my father and, and monger the public. I'm here to really actually put a lot to ease that we have been told is, a, you know, a danger to us that actually is not. Uh, which is what my dad has been paid to do and many other uh, media figures and things for this big brother type of, um, you know, existence and, and, you know, to get to that, excuse me. But anyways, they took my children on April 15th. They said that I was trying to flee with them. Uh, when I was, when I was getting in my car, they held us in. Um, I don't know where I was supposed to go with no shoes on them and no bags. They put on the, um, they falsified the reports in other words, saying that we had bags packed. Uh, they took the kids saying that they could smell cat pee from outside the garage. We live in Florida. There's bushes that smell like cat pee. There's neighborhood cats. Uh, and that was actually ironically something that one of the other parents had told me. They said, Megan, they'll say that they can smell cat pee and take your kids. And there it was months later in my report. That's like the biggest example. I was like, this is literally creepy. Like this is literally creepy. And I cannot believe, you know, being an advocate, even hearing about, I would never believe that it's to this level of falsified documents of just narrative no truth and these are lives of children and and families under the guise of for the in the best interest of which again goes back to my father's narratives my father's you know whole shtick for 40 years you know in your best interest that's what we're seeing now with government and these masks and all this kind of stuff so it goes far and wide um these are bigger notions that that's what penny specializes in and once i'm done ratting off the facts and my spiel you know we'll, we'll go into that but they did take my kids we had an entire trial they had me falsely arrested. Penny said earlier, I called her from jail. I was never in jail. God is good. I bonded myself out as much as they wanted me to have to spend a night in the county jail um, where we know and, and the town knows about, you know, people that have been covered up that have died in, in our county jail or in transport. Then it's been covered up. And, and they did the entire thing to me the day before my child, my children's trial. They had me go to the courthouse and sit there for an in-person hearing while the sheriff was signing off on bond for me uh and they didn't yeah, have i was the just hearing. i was just told they arrested you yeah they arrested me that's at all the I, courthouse. That's all 
to really put that trauma and psychological crap. And, uh, and then I was in booking freezing cold in the jail and with, you know, all the guy convicts hitting on me, harassing me, you know, everything. And, you know, I don't mean to sound like spoiled rich girl or whatever, but I'm not a criminal and I don't hang out with criminals. And uh, that for me, that is a very traumatizing experience. That's something I never would have ever imagined and never would put myself in as a law abiding citizen and one that's supported law enforcement my entire life in the public eye. So I don't, you know, I don't know how else to go about that. Um, so then, then they um, applied for me to have an automatic jail transfer the next day uh, so that I would have to show up after a night in jail uh, and in shackles or whatever for my kid's trial. Um, I bonded myself out with my, I mean, my friends from on the outside bonded me out with some of my fund money. I had to sell my car. Um, they took my home, they forced sailed my home and filed for that a week prior to our uh, 10 days to two weeks prior to taking my kids, which shows that this was a plan and this was, you know, on dates and times and, and a plan. I mean, what else do we want to say about it? Um, I didn't do it. Don't make me have to say the crazy stuff, right? So anyways, this really opened my eyes. My parents did this, you know, give the state custody. They did all of this knowing that the state would get custody um, of my children and give it to them in kinship guardianship. They are trying to commit guardianship fraud um, so that they can ultimately get a conservatorship on me. We brought up Lou Taylor and, you know, that goes, everyone here is familiar with Britney Spears at this point. And, you know, Britney, a lot of these things like Epstein, Britney, me, a lot of it get, you know, people kind of keep that outside of themselves because it's a celebrity or it's this or that. And these are real things. Florida is the number one state for guardianship and conservatorship abuse. And this is a veterans and elders as well as children in everything and attention needs to be brought to that through Brittany, um, but also through the CPS system. And that's how they slowly break you down to be able people and, and uh, you know, I can tell you exact names of players. If we took the Britney Spears situation, like Lou Taylor, her father, her brother, her sister, those exact players have different names in my situation. Um, and many others. So it's a protocol that Penny will get into. It's a playbook, how they take your home, they discredit you, they take your children, they break you, they say you need help, and they grab their chest the whole way through. And when on the back end, they're all profiting from it. And this includes my brothers, um, you know, and a lot of people can't believe it. And it, and I can't believe half of it. Um, so you know, that really brings out the, the system, the CPS system. It only encouraged me more to talk out about it because there are hundreds of thousands and millions of parents and children that are suffering every single day within our system. And it is the largest way that, that our children are trafficked. People need to realize that. The National Center, if you don't want to believe me and you want to believe agencies that lie to you or nonprofits that lie to you, the center themselves, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children will tell you that over 80% of children that are put into child trafficking come from the CPS system itself, which then leads me to say, why aren't they doing anything about it then? Why isn't that what they're talking out about? Why aren't there huge campaigns from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children saying, we need to stop child trafficking in this real way. We need to redo this system. You know, pride is a deadly sin. And, you know, when systems are, we are the people that have allowed these systems to come into place and to exist. And when something's no longer serving and not working, let's get over ourselves and let's redo it. Let's stop it. We're very blessed these days that there are so many people that have been through it, have the empathy for it, have worked in different ways of healing besides traditional Nazi Germany mental health industry that's being pushed on us now. Then we can, there's better ways is the point. We need to bring families together instead of breaking them up for profit. We need to end CPS and we need to present and come together better ways to help our children because there are real issues and our children do need us. But this whole, it takes a village and all of this has been horribly perverted by the Clintons, by Title IV, 
um, by these databases, by the National Center for Missing Exploited Children, by uh, under, Underground Railroad. I mean, different all of these different things that have put out these huge narratives in protecting our children when actually they are on the deeper level more so than these predators in your neighborhood or these serial killers that they're promoting to you, uh, these heebie-jeebie guys, which will go back, you know, that goes back to my brother Adam's case, you know, and we'll eventually get to that. But, you know, really what I wanted to focus on was really addressing this with people and having people start asking questions. If people have a, you know, kind of a adverse reaction to it or, or things like that, I actually like it. Let's let's talk about that. Let's look from each other's perspectives. Why wouldn't you believe that? Let's talk about that. Why, you know, what what's preventing you from speaking up? You know, these different things. That's what we have to do to cross the division and to actually be able to do something about it. And we can, you know, it's not bigger than us. It's not up to the judiciary. It's not that we hire those people. We are the one that pay their salaries and they take oaths to protect us. And if they're profiting and not protecting, then we have a right as the people to address that and to stop it. And many, and many in government and everything are not supporting it. It's all being allowed. District attorneys, this goes all the way up. It starts from local. The people trafficking your children and doing it are all around you. Yes, you watching, you know, your schools, your churches, your, your local departments, everything. It is around you. And that's not to be, ooh, crazy. It's not saying everyone. It's not this exaggerated thing so that you can chalk it off and, and go to sleep at night. This is everywhere around you. And it needs to be addressed. And it goes all the way up as well. So, um, you know, for me, people go to war, you know, when mothers lose their children in war and they go sacrifice their lives and fight for our country um, under God, if fighting for our children and to, to stop this, this legal trafficking and kidnapping and murder um, and profit on our children, if that's what I, that's, you know, what God has given to me, then I'm thankful every single day and I will give him all the praise and I'll never stop. You know, you just, you just made me fight more by taking my children. Now I have nothing to lose. You took my life. They literally took my life without physically killing me. And that is by government definition, non-physical forms of torture. There's also a documented playlist for that. Uh, and one of the reasons why I also started speaking up and realizing my abuse on a much deeper level than every day coercive control or, or domestic abuse. So I've talked enough for a second. I think Penny should get in there. Um, you know, I've got other things supporting facts and different things when people want to know or when it comes up, but you know, that's really what's happened. Their end goal is a conservatorship um, where all of my, my rights will be taken control of me. They can control my medical, they can control um, money. They also will then be able to um, access any financial or inheritance that they have done creative accounting and hidden their money uh, in me as we are seeing that, you know, a lot of this has been planned out for several years, if not longer. I know Penny will venture to say my whole life. So um, Megan, did you want to uh, say your website and your GoFundMe? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, aside from all of this crazy stuff, <laughs> I do, uh, I, I do, um, well, now you caught me off guard. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry. Aside from all the craziness, <laughs> I, I am, I am a life coach. I specialize in a uh, holistic lifestyle transformation. Um, I'm also a healer in terms of specializing in trauma, um, specifically childhood trauma and awakening. You know, a lot of us are waking up and, and it's a really not an easy thing. And so I really sit with people and help uh, navigate that as well as look at your own hardships and um, any physical ailments and things like that, but a holistic way to healing from within out and, and in a really nice way that, that is personal to you and um, also shows you literally how you can live your life, you know, just transferring your, your pantry to all natural, you know, things that are enjoyable because after we get over this darkness and these big humps, 
you know, there's, there's a lot to look forward to, you know, RSO, um, I do biohacking and I work for a great company that I'm looking for anyone that wants to join my team, um, and also educate others about biohacking and how to clean out your cells and, you know, all these great things naturally that we, that we have. So I do work one-on-one with people as well as in February, I will be doing, a class and a workshop online uh, for those that sign up. We're, we're really starting slow and I need people to be patient with me because I'm doing all of this um, in trauma and fighting and everything. But I do want to, you know, keep helping. That's what, you know, keeps me strong. And also, you know, I need to provide for my children where, you know, again, I've lost my house. I've got, you know, maybe a thousand dollars to my name and a lot of expenses, um, and, and, you know, a lot of that. So it's just been really mortifying, but I'm not going to give up. We have to keep going. And, uh, and it's been so amazing. The people that have supported me. Um, and, and again, you can look on many other um, interviews for more details on my story and stuff. I don't want people to think that I'm being vague, but we're, we're here on, on certain time. And we're here to talk about, you know, more of a broader picture of, of what's going on today. So my, my website is the wellness mercantile.com the wellness mercantile and then um others have set up an amazing fund for me uh by the grace of god under give send go so that's give send go uh dot com is it dot com or dot org penny i'm sorry i'm, I'm usually looking right now i'm, I'm going to copy it to send it to her it's https slash slash give send go dot com slash okay, megan so m-e-g-h-a-n wash it's yeah, it's dot com, give send com, and then backslash Megan Walsh. Um, and then also, again, people can we'll do this at the end, but people can find me on Twitter. We're just kind of trying to keep it simple, but that's Megan Walsh, M E G H A N. I have an H in my name, uh, underscore on Twitter. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's important. That's one of the biggest ways that these messages get through, you know, these algorithms on social media, they don't want you getting followers or being seen, you know, so the more people that can organically follow you through hearing your story, I encourage everybody, you know, help Megan by getting a service from her. Not only are you going to help, help her with her bills, but you're going to also experience some deep healing yourself. And she's super easy to connect to online. If you have questions, I always say, go ask them you guys are so eager to talk, you know, you've been silenced for so long. It's like, you're all so willing to use your voice. And I think it's just amazing that you're able to do that, but you're so accessible too. So people who do have questions, you know, go reach out to Megan, reach out to Penny, ask them yourself and they'll, they'll answer you. Um, I interviewed, uh, Jack Pendergrass, Nuga Jack the other day and he brought uh, light, you know, I don't have children. So learning about these systems is new for me, but you know, to put it in perspective, like what Megan's saying, you know, humans, we're a commodity, like we're owned. And all of us have a certain amount of money that these systems can pump out of us in our lifetime. And children are one of the, the most, uh, the most prolific and the most expensive and uh, priceless commodities that they can squeeze lots and lots of money out of. And it's incredible what they're able to do. And it's not, uh, you know, it's the parents that end up paying dearly for this in, in, in child support and in court fees and, and all the ways that the perpetrators are able to take advantage and squeeze more money. You know, these government businesses, they have to run just like any other business and they require money to do that. There's people that want more and more money every year tacked onto their salary or, or bonuses or commissions or incentives. And so think about that also, you guys, as you're listening to these stories, you know, like what is a human worth going through these systems? And if that's the product that is being sold in a system, how much money are people going to try to squeeze out of that product so they can make the most money themselves? Absolutely. And like we were saying, I mean, people, some, I mean, we don't even like to go there. We can't sometimes in our minds, but, you know, children are, you know, reusable drugs. You get, you sell them off. They're done. Children and humans are reusable, but children are young. It's starting young. You can use them. You can put them through a system. You can then put them in the prison system later. I mean, this is generational and then go after theirs, but not only that, this is big pharma. This is drugging our children. These are not foster care homes. These are foster prisons. These children are being drugged up universally. There's many children that are grown now or have aged out and want to speak out against this and the horrific 
things that they've experienced within the system. It's breaking our children. Uh, this goes also with, you know, again, the indoctrinations that I brought up earlier and and uh, the, the homosexuality, the incest, um, and then as well, all the way to children going missing within the system and not being reported. I mean, there are thousands of children each year that go missing within the system itself are not reported and money is still collected on them. Um, you know, again, their income for people, you know, foster parents. And, and the way that adoption and foster parenting is being promoted and incentivized and everything. They want division between the parents. So that's more services, more money. They go after protective parents because they know that you're going to fight more. You're not going to give up. They're going to get more and more funds out of you, more money. They're going to drain you. But it really, you know, it really goes after our children when they are within that system and it breaks them. And children need parents. And this is their claim of this therapeutic, not punitive. There are real issues of child abuse and we have a criminal justice system for that. Let's use it. Okay. That's valid. We've covered that now. Moving on. This is not therapeutic whatsoever. They are, like I said, breaking children and breaking families. They harass the parents. They move the children around. They terrorize you. Children, if you, if your child is taken from you and not placed in kinship and placed in a foster home or with foster parents, you are not even told where that child is. So now your child's been kidnapped and is technically missing to you. So, um, you know, and just the way that they do everything saying before your rights are even terminated, they just, you know, because they're wards of the state, even the paperwork they gave me when they, the day they took my kids says on one of the first few pages, how they have the right to answer any requests for organ or tissue donations. Yeah, you guys, the fine print is real. Um, it, it, it's, it's horrible. Children are passed through this system. Names are changed. Their ages are changed. It's international. We have found also forms with Adam Walsh forms and requirements for out-of-state adoption and international adoptions. I've been contacted by women saying that the National Center and the International Center for Missing Exploited Children actually advised and helped their abusive exes to set them up to say that they were fleeing with the children and that they needed to get the children back. Penny, are you hearing what I'm saying right now? Because that's exactly, did everyone just hear yes. that? Because that's exactly what my dad used. And my parents with these forms show that they have been involved in setting up and establishing this system for decades. So what does my brother have to do? Like I said in the beginning, I think when we were talking earlier, what does he have to do with adoptions and child abuse? Unless there's more to the story than we thought or that we knew. Um, I also found different things about runaway aid, a nonprofit in Fort Lauderdale for uh, runaway aid that uh, was uh, had my father's name on it on SunBiz. Anyone can look it up. Uh, for that Fort was Florida. prior to Adam Walsh, right? That was well, prior to his kidnapping. Yeah. That's what I was about to say is that it was prior to my brother being abducted. So I thought that my father was in the hotel business and that he mm -hmm you know, just suddenly was forced into the kid business, if you will, when his son was suddenly abducted and taken. But to me, that shows that you've established, you know, funding for a cause for children, runaways, which they do still are involved with. Um, so that goes wide. And uh, again, uh, Dark Outpost, uh, Penny has been amazing on the Dark Outpost with the slideshows and things that break down the National Center and the different players within that, and then how that filters out after that. But lastly, uh, Florida last year for the viewers got $7.5 million plus for DCF. And this year for 2022, I just looked up the statistics and the ruling, and they were granted over $20 million for DCF services. When you look at the fine print in the Title IV, you will see that only a very small percentage actually goes to foster children. The majority of that funding will go to administrative salaries, case management, and case planning. That's $20 million plus of incentives to take our children. And guess what, Emma, how much is incentivized on that to return our children? None. You guys, we need we need to start speaking out about this and 
you know, this is really a nonpartisan issue. This is not political. There's no divide on this. This is not just national, it's global. We all have to come together on this. And if we can address this, it might sound big, but it really does change our future. You know, our children are being broken and how that keeps going on and trickles down for the future of our society is, is, it would make anyone, you know, drop to their knees, honestly. Um, and that's not a future that I want for my children, nor anybody else's. Um, so again, I want to thank you for, you know, just speaking out. I want everyone to really start asking us questions, start asking each other, start talking, have people over and some wine, you know, or something like that and talk about it be like, yo, I know this is crazy to talk about, but you know, it's not all about just like satanic drug, um, you know, blood drinking, you know, we need to talk about how this is really happening and affecting us as the people and, and what it's going to take, like you said, you know, Emma is really the voice of the people, the people coming together. And that's why people like Penny and I are here and so accessible because I'm not into all that I left all of that other crap and the bureaucracy and, and the elitism and the talk to my agent, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. I'm here as much as I can show up. And I know all of us are here because it's going to take the people and we want the voice of the people. We want people to know the truth and, and to feel grounded in that. We're not here to convince anybody of anything. A hundred percent. And Penny, I'll let you kind of take over a little bit. I just want to say it's interesting looking at the different levels of programming, you know, and we typically hear that word, we think about something like MK Ultra, and we don't realize how many different levels there are that seep down into society. So Megan, like, for example, your father, who you're alleging is a criminal and who a lot of others are coming forth and saying, hey, here's my puzzle piece to this, like, she's right. You know, you're putting together this puzzle of this person that had convinced the public over a long period of time that he was the one that took out the monsters, that he wasn't one. So we've all been programmed to look at, at somebody like John Walsh and to say, he's the hero. He's the one who convicts the criminals. He would never like, it's not in our consciousness to think that that could be a cover or a veil to cover up something that's going on behind the scenes. And the same thing works for our court systems. You know, we're so programmed and conditioned to think that courts exist to bring justice to, to criminals and to do the right thing, which is very uh, clever marketing, just like a business does trying to market their shoes as the best shoes or whatever the product is that they're selling. You know, they're, they're giving us a narrative where behind the scenes, that's not what these systems are developed for. That's not what it was designed for. It's designed to sell you on using it so they can profit the most money possible off of you. And so those different levels of programming, when people actually start to like just question that, that's when you start to wake up to how business works and how money, always follow the money is, is number one in all of these agencies and every single government. It's not about we the people at the end of the day. That's where we need to come together and take our power back because they're saying, no, this is about me at the expense of you. Instead of them being here for us, like we're working for them and it's not vice versa, how we were intended you know, how we have been programmed to think that these systems exist. So Penny, and, it's very, and it's very paid to play. I mean, I think that's the notion that people really need to kind of look at to keep it simple. You know, we're not saying that, you know, John Walsh is going out murdering children in the streets. This is right. a pay to play. This is, you know, people are complicit when you turn a blind eye, there's accessory to crimes, you know, things of this nature. So, you know, and what you're saying within the judiciary, within our system, society, I mean, that's a big notion for people to learn just and, and look at on an on an overall basis and become the observer, you know, from my, from all my background, my life, you know, coaching and all my healing and training everywhere and all over the world, India to Colorado to Boulder, you know, all that, um, you know, really just to learn to become the observer. Let's start taking ourselves and our opinion. We know our opinions. We know our feelings about it. Let's start putting ourselves in other people's shoes. And also even like you just beautifully put, put yourself in the situation from the outside. If I was in the judiciary, if I was a lawyer, if I was this, what would, what is my intention? Where is, where am I coming from? How am I profiting? You know, and, and we become a lot smarter that way. And you can see a lot of different, you know, things, these puzzle pieces start getting, you know, being put together a lot more when you can kind of become the observer of, you know, within and without, if you will. 
Well, we know someone that came to us that said that she was uh, running for Congress, and I actually think uh, you run for Congress, Megan. <laughs> My daughter <laughs> always said I would be the next president or some crazy stuff about president it scared the crap out of me. So. <laughs> right. Well, you've been associated with presidents. Mm -hmm. That's real. My whole right. life. You're given to, you know, presented to Reagan when you were, what, two or three? Oh, as a baby in my mom's arms, like weeks old in the Rose Garden. And then later again, when I was mm -hmm. two, two and a half. And every president since. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know, when Megan is in her fight, it's not just, you're, it's not a normal fight. People think that this is a normal CPS fight. It is not. I'll, I'm not dismissing all of those that are engaged with fights with CPS because CPS is a corrupted agency and it has many corrupted agents within it. But I'm saying in this particular instance, Megan is literally fighting heads of the CIA, presidents that her father knows in the national media, heads of the CIA, heads of the FBI, heads of the NSA um, and sheriffs which are and the in industry. a Freemasonic society. Yes, and the industry. It's I'll complex. It. It's yeah, complex. I mean, again, we'd have to do other shows, but I could go into MK Ultra. I could literally break down how it was done, uh, how my own experience within it. You know, I can only speak from my own experience, know my own experience, aside from research and other people's testimonies but you know yeah the way that the industry does it uh that was another thing I was speaking out about I left everything to speak out about pop culture and specifically our entertainment industry and and um you know music fashion art all of that and how it really targets our children um and the Luciferian doctrine uh, I really talk a lot as a as a religious scholar of over 20 years um I think I'm qualified enough and have lived it and looked at it and um you know about how we really are being pushed this Luciferian doctrine in the guise of love and light and a lot of other things. I know that's not going to be popular with a lot of people to say that, but I say that with love and, and because it really is a tricky business and it's, it's really targeting our children. It's not targeting parents, you know, parents chalk it off or whatever, but they, you know, that's fine, but you're not the target. Our children are the target and they create that next race that comes up and goes to work to get that Kylie lip line or that, you know, to be that star and gives up everything. And, and, you know, we just need our children to realize that they're, they have so much self-worth. We all offer something so unique to this world. Um, being a teacher, being a, you know, being a, a coach, you know, things like that, that are just really beautiful. Um, as opposed to how, you know, you're raised when you're in these circles and, and then you really do see how these are agendas that you are paid a lot of money to live by and you're, you know, you're brainwashed or even put in situations where you think that that's even natural and that you're, you know, doing it for a good cause. So there, it's wide, it's widespread, but. A lot of people also don't realize that um, you're a designer. You had your own design label. I saw some of your, saw one of the dresses. It was absolutely beautiful. It's stunning. Thank you. Yeah. I specialize in uh, hand painted silk uh, and did installation art. I've definitely been, I, people want to talk about Hunter Biden and all the money for the art and everything. I mean, I started in that world. My first paintings were bought for $10,000 and $8,000 and things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm a good painter, but at that point I was a week out of college. I wasn't that good. Uh, and when we look and see who it was, it was Hank Asher. So again, this is laundering and built, giving, you know, adding worth, you know, helping your, your friends add worth to their children. I mean, that's pretty creepy. Um, you know, different things like that. But then yes, when I was in fashion, I had a beautiful clothing line named blank silk and, uh, I did launch it. New York Fashion Week, uh, in India, I did shows, Miami, um, and headlined at LA Fashion Week, where I was targeted uh, there, and that's how I got involved with um, the whole Kanye West scene, and, and my son's father, who is his childhood best friend, and current best friend, uh, and that's a whole other side of the industry of targeting, and 
triggering that MK Ultra programming that you've been brought up in, um, stealing your intellectual property and you don't know, you think it's opportunity, handlers coming in and, and doing that when again, it's under the guise of, oh, I'm, I'm making it somewhere or you're getting noticed. Um, the agencies, again, I can, it just keeps going back to the deeper puppet strings, you know, the longer puppet strings and the darker suits, the more you go, the deeper you go my dad's agencies, talent agencies involved, you know, different things, networks, look at who my father's worked for, Fox, CNN. Keeps oh going. It keeps going. Oh my gosh. It's crazy. All the connections. You know? <laughs> and even yeah. before we jumped on here, Penny's breaking down whenever we're waiting for you to log on. Uh, we Penny and I are breaking all these connections and I'm like, geez, it's, it's amazing how whenever you do look at a situation and you actually ask a question about it, that's a, that's different from the narrative that you're given. You know, it's interesting. The answers that, that you can come up with, if you just ask that first question and care to go take a couple of minutes to research it. Now for people not familiar with the Adam Walsh case, um, could you tell a little bit about what was the public narrative that was presented about his case? Um, and what are some things that you have found behind the scenes that uh, negate that or are different from what the public's been told? Absolutely. Thanks for asking that. Um, I will preface that, you know, I was born uh, not even a year after Adam was was kidnapped or disappeared. I say disappeared at this point, not kidnapped or murdered, but disappeared Um, because we don't know what happened. As Penny said earlier, if you ask anybody that's really looked into it and wants to be honest about it, um, the public narrative that everyone knows, they will recognize Adam Walsh from Code Adam, Amber Alert, um, the mil- face on the mi- on the milk carton, the missing face on the milk carton, um, missing flyers, Walmart, all of that. But most notably for the the little boy with the baseball bat. Um, that's that was really his marketing. And oh god, that sounds horrible, guys. But you know, really, what was put out and what people know. So the little boy with the baseball bat, Adam Walsh, was six and a half years old. In 1981, July 27th of 1981, he was um, allegedly abducted from the Sears department store in Hollywood, Florida, which happens to be across the street from the Hollywood Police Department. Um, and he was kidnapped. They did not know my mother. The narrative that the that the public was given was that my mother, Rave Walsh. Uh, went shopping uh, to get a lamp that was on sale and left my brother at six and a half years old in um, at the Atari video game station in the toy department of the Sears uh, store. She says that uh, she left my brother for five to 10 minutes at the most, uh, went to go look for the lamp. It wasn't there when she returned. He wasn't there that she asked, um, you know, for the intercom, his name to be called over the intercom system. My father says that it wasn't called over the intercom system. Uh, then, you know, from there, the police were called, they came in, the Hollywood police department handled it. Um, and there was a two week search for my brother's remains all over the area. It was local and national news. My parents went, um, you know, on Good Morning America and national television, you know, as soon as this happened, which is wild to me. I mean, I can't even get a story these days about John Walsh taking, saving his grandchildren from his crazy daughter. Where's that headline even, you know, I mean, <laughs> can we get real about that? I'm sure the Inquirer would love it, but they already called me and asked me for an exclusive and I turned it down because I wanted to talk and I wanted to be amongst the people and I didn't want them to be able to control the narrative. That's also how they do it. Um, so, so any, and many other publications know there is a media blackout on it. So back to my brother's story is that there is a national search and local search for my, or national knowledge of, and, and local search for my brother's remains, um, kind of like the um, recent Brian Laundry uh, effort, I will say. Um, it was a two-week search of a local area with local cops, very similar pictures, literally to pictures of my brother's search efforts when you put them next to each other. Um, it was a two-week search. The remains were found in rising and falling water. My brother's remains were found in Bureau Beach, where we grew up and lived, which was another huge 
question I always ask, why do we live and grow up in the town where my brother's head was found? Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, so, so that was found in rising and falling water in a canal by fishermen, they say. Uh, and it was only the skull found just like Brian Laundry, uh, And it was identified by dental, his dental records, just like Brian Laundry. And my father also came out on for this Gabby Petito case and everyone saw him online and said, you know, this guy, is he okay? Uh, he's calling for Brian Laundrie's suicide. I mean, he really showed a lot of his colors and cards and, and people were saying how he really should not be allowed on TV to be able to speak like this and everything. Now imagine being in my position and it's your own father, you know, and, and he's not being so polite in the public eye and, and he's hiding his own past and crimes and all of this. So you know, if he's gone to the extent of using my children to do it, I mean, what else are we putting past him at this point? I hate to say. Um, so he came out, my point there, and saying this huge narrative while he's doing this to his daughter in his hometown, uh, which, by the way, the month that they started this, I mentioned April Fool's Day. Um, Gabby Petito's father happened to move to the same small Vero Beach out of all of the United States, all of the world the same month that they started injuring me and my children and doing this. And now Gabby Petito's father is here following the same John Walsh protocol and public presence, which stems from Joe Matthews uh, to this stoic father. I'm going to do something right about it. Here's a foundation on domestic violence. And my father's agenda is the mental illness agenda. And they're also trying to get funding for a huge mental health campus here in town around the Cleveland Clinic, starting with a youth mental health facility. And before they did that, I was the one that discovered that. I called the hospital board months leading up to it. I called them out for saying it very respectfully, politely called them out for, you know, getting using the school board to get CARES Act funding to open youth mental health facilities to get their bigger plan of this mental health campus. And so now here, horrifying. Now we have John Walsh and Mr. Petito here in town. He, Mr. Petito's achieved his domestic violence effort and now getting funding like they do with the domestic violence. And now here's John Walsh saying that his daughter is mentally ill and needs to take her children and all of this for the mental illness aspect of it. Yelling on the screen, dirty laundries, the dirty laundries while he's covering his own freaking dirty laundry, you guys, mental, yeah. mental illness and domestic abuse of his own family in the same town. And that you song that. that that he had shouted out because it was an actual song by the Eagles. It's um, I make my living off the evening news. Just give me something, something I can use. People love it when you lose. They love dirty laundry. And what does John Walsh do? He makes his living off the evening news, off of murders and kidnaps. And he also solicited a name. mob mentality involving the Petitos. Uh, to that everyone should go and kill Brian Laundry, or that he should shoot himself. And he said that repeatedly. And then, of course, he ends up with a head in Alligator Alley, you know, uh, poke salad, Annie, Gator's got your granny. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and you know, who, who actually shot him? Did he shoot himself or did someone kill him? Mm -hmm. And in my protocol for the mental illness, it would be you know, take my children, take my home, take everything behind the scenes to break me. No one would be able to survive that normally if I didn't have the grace of God. And they know that my children are my world. Anyone that knows me knows I did not do anything besides my children. And then obviously, I mean, I wasn't crazy about, but like that and be in the community. I didn't go out and party. I gave up everything, you know, my children were my world. And so here you go after that heart space you take everything from you know me and everything and i'm sorry penny knows as well the non-physical form of torture the end goal is to break the individual so if i were to commit suicide or end up suicided oh they can grab their chest here's a oh she was just mentally we did everything we could for her da 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 da, da. and that's also a thing that has stood the test of time with these masonic men 
and and blaming women or saying that women are crazy. We hear in history about hysteria and men in the past and 50 Stepford wives um, committing women when you do. And my father's family actually has a history of doing that that is documented to the women that didn't go along with everything. So, um, you know, it's, this is a it's a thing, guys. It's a thing. <laughs> But then my dad would be able to grab his chest and, and say that. And, and I want to set the record straight. This is a witch hunt and I am not a witch. I'm a child of God and I would never do anything to hurt myself. I would never do anything um, but fight for my children and, and try to get the truth of, of what is going on, what my dad is hiding and what my parents and, and their cohorts are, are hiding or what they've done. So I it's really justice. sad that today that people who are defending who are whistleblowers that actually have to go on camera and say, I am not suicidal. I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is sad. Now, Megan, I'm curious, what was your relationship like with your father growing up? And when did it occur in your life? Were you always kind of uncomfortable around him? Uh, were there signs that you had growing up that maybe he wasn't who he said he was? Or what was that moment for you in your life where you started questioning him? and the narrative that, that he had portrayed to you as a child? Uh, I didn't start questioning until about two years ago and the whole Epstein thing. And I started looking into my brother, Adam, honestly, you guys, 36 years, I, I blamed myself for everything that they blamed me for. Um, I was set up with very abusive men and left and, you know, they, they, you know, supported me in the time, but that was also used to get me to go on to something else. They would take my intellectual property. They'd get me to start doing another thing um, under the guise of them helping me because I'm just so you know, a mess that's victim shaming. I was, I was, I was abused, abandoned, groomed, whatever by men. And, uh, and, you know, I thought my dad would be a huge proponent for that or a huge victor for that. And now he's actually going and using these men, which is another, you know, part of protocol and, and the, um, the occult, but going back to these men and, and, you know, introducing my children to them doing all this stuff, which my children, I mean, no one is thinking from the children's perspective on any of this. They're absolutely literally being used they're prisoners of war right now. So, um, but going back to, a, you know, growing up, I mean, again, I am, I am very humbly admitting, you know, I loved my father. My, that's the problem was the idolatry. I loved my father. I never questioned a thing. It's, I was, you know, count me as one of you all, you know, if you were a fan of John Walsh, I mean, I was his biggest one, you know, and my mother alienated me from my father. My mother was really my covert covert dark abuser my entire life. I mean, I would grow up literally in solitary confinement being told that I need to be grounded, you know, and, and uh, for like a bad grade, you know, or a C or a D or something like that. Um, my mom would like ground me from the phone and, you know, would catch me. And instead of like handling it normally, she'd like chase me through our mansion, which I called the shining house and would chase me and tackle me down the stairs, get the phone. And I, I grew up a lot of the time in my closet, um, in different houses that we grew up in. It was always in the closet since I was small. And, uh, I, you know, the last closet that I had with them where they have my children now on an Island, um, I would literally, there was like a little dresser by the door and I would pull out the dresser drawers so that she couldn't open the door all the way. And she would bark at me through the door. And that's exactly what I saw again. Then on Thanksgiving when she's, you know, assaulting me in front of my children and, and biting me. And, and I had seen several different times, you know, leading up to that in the year of her literally barking at me like a dog, which, you know, in my training and all of that, you know, those that's for a different time to get into, but that's entities, that's lower vibrational energy. Um, that's all the stuff that, again, I talk about and, and have trained and um, studied for, for decades to understand about, you know, how our energy system, our subtle body, excuse me, and, uh, and how that all works within, you know, the esoteric realms, the spiritual realms and, and the things we cannot see. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. But, I grew up in a very, very, uh, abusive home and my mom did some really evil things to me but I can say this she never barked at me that's just it, I don't remember her biting me either but you know that's just it's horrific it's a horrific thing to even hear it that you know my mom barked at me when I was growing up and that I had to hide in closets 
and and you know eventually then she bit you like a dog I mean just, well and it's Stockholm the- it's literally Stockholm you know my parents uh, I have been told and I would actually like to pursue it I don't want to be doing any of this I want to be left alone with my children and I want to teach people better ways um, but you know, Munchausen, and I've been shopped since I was eight years old by my parents to different therapists. And my father even testified in my thing, your honor, we have taken, our, we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars her entire life to get her diagnosed and still don't have a diagnosis. Well, shouldn't, doesn't that answer that right there? And it's also my career. Like you are gaslighting every single thing that I do anything about, um, and this is not just me. I'm, I'm speaking this for other people, you know, my, the natural healing approaches, organic, you know, functional nutrition, integrative health, homeschooling, Christianity, all of these things were demonized in my case. There was no evidence of anything. It's people that they get together that either have things to hide of their own or are financially incentivized to be part of this or rely on my parents for their livelihood and their future. Um, This is not crazy. This is pretty grounded and you're pretty much giving it, you know, being given it laid out. And the fact that you're still choosing as our judiciary, as the people who take oaths and that we pay to correct these things and know the absolute truth about it. And this is what you're choosing, how you're choosing to handle it and still go along with it. You would never have a criminal case and convict someone without an investigation. Uh, This is worse than being in prison to me living without my children and being accused of all this and watching them literally being taken and given to my, our abusers, you know, under hearsay. And because John Walsh has more money and has been acting longer, you know, as an actor, like, I don't know, guys, it's just, anyways. I was watching a show the other day um, about Reagan and I I started a PowerPoint about Reagan. It's pretty long, but, um, and in there, he said, in there, he said he didn't believe that you could be a president of the United States without being an actor. So, you know, his acting exactly. training facilitated him for uh, his public persona as the president of the United States. His son said he lived basically in a fantasy world. So he lived two, two worlds. He lived in one perfect little world. And, um, but yet he also had affiliations with the mob and uh, with MCA, which had its tentacles in every facet of the um, of Hollywood, and it, from the from motion pictures to television, and he also facilitated an agreement, which was a compromising agreement, which wasn't allowed for the agent to also be the agency, because if you were to sue your agent, you couldn't sue the the agency or the union that was representing you, if the two were one and the same. So he facilitated that agreement when he became president of SAG. So we're talking about all the same things. When I talk about different people, when I, uh, the other day when we were on uh, Dark Outpost and I was talking about uh, the Fountain Blue Hotel, the Fountain Blue Hotel was actually owned by an individual who, uh, there was a book written about the Novak family. So Ben Novak was Ben Novak Sr. Ben Novak Jr. was murdered um, four months after the closure of the Adam Walsh case by Joe Matthews, who Joe Matthews and his brother Pete knew the owners and they knew the son. And the son uh, used to regularly go to the to Miami PD. They they knew uh, and so at that at that hotel they had Meyer Lansky who ran its operations out of there and the Bahamas and the diplomat which her dad worked at was t- it's 12 miles from the Fountain Blue. I used to go and um, sunbathe behind the Fountain Blue and I was telling them on the show that Gary Shanling came up to me in 1976 and I spent the day with him and I took him to my rehearsal and I spent the evening, then he drove me home and he asked me to marry him, which I now know it had nothing to do with actually wanting to get married. It was giving homage 
like Marriage to the Beast, giving homage to my brother John's sister. Well, and there's public there's public personas versus private lives, and that's what people don't realize. These people assign like actors to a role. It's a lifelong role, and they are yes. getting paid, and you get a lifestyle. You get these things for doing it. Kim and Kanye West. I mean, I was in PR. That's you are set up with new upcoming stars. I mean, this is all coordinated efforts. Um, like she's saying, you know, and and. Reagan did come out, which reminds me of America's Most Wanted, which Penny, you know, helped reveal that, you know, Rupert Murdoch was, you know, Fox, Fox Network was fledgling before America's Most Wanted came out. And he was absolutely obsessed with having America's Most Wanted in the U.S. Um, And two other known hosts or actors were previously um, approached to be the host and they wouldn't do it. And then comes John Walsh and, you know, my brother's murder and he's put in this place and, and put on this pedestal. So um, you know, of interest I- to that where, where Megan and I again intersect. So and when I'm researching my family and I'm researching the ties to Jolie West, which I wondered if he was at, where was that place that they kept you at? Passages in Malibu? passages and real quick before I forget I wanted to speak to the Bahamas when you said that and this kind of stuff people think that like mobs aren't real anymore we talk about the cartels we know the cartels people think that the mobs aren't real hits on people's lives aren't real you know all that that was a huge rumor about my brother and still is to this day when you're talking to locals and people that were actually there in the area at the time about this being mob related, drug related, a ransom on my, that my father wouldn't pay allegedly. And then things happening to my brother and the manner that we find the head and all this kind of stuff, which, which is making more sense. You guys come on looking back. Mm-hmm. Hindsight is 2020. We've got 40 years. This is amazing. We can look back on this now with fresh eyes, but you know, I mean that it, it, it goes deep, <laughs> you know. It's, so when ahead. I'm researching, when I'm researching um, my family, right, and and Megan and my family intersect in so many different ways, and our stories intersect in so many different ways. So when you say how did we find each other, I, I'm going to have to say it was God because there's no way that we would have been able to find each other in any kind of a timeline. We our lives were separate, but now we find that they're integrated. So. Um, I was my my first husband was Steve Zenos, and he was a psychologist, and he only practiced for a very short time. But he ran his parents' um, psychology office off of 17th Street in Santa Ana. They were marriage family crisis counselors. In the 80s, I attended a fashion uh, a fashion fundraiser for Teresa Saldana. Teresa Saldana was an actress who um, she was in Raging Bull, Scorsese's film, and she was being stalked. And at one point. Uh, she was stabbed 10 times in front of her, uh, her residence. She ended up getting divorced. So I think at some point she probably saw Steve's mother or Steve's father because they were marriage family uh, crisis counselors. But um, I later find out, um, I attended the fundraiser and at the fundraiser, she's, she said her only condition for going and doing that fundraiser in Santa Ana was that they would make sure that she didn't have to sit out in the open anywhere. She was still terrified and for many, many years afterwards. And I approached her and said, are you okay, Teresa? And she's like, no, um, they promised me that I would have a, um, a limo here. So I go to Steve's mom and I say, hey, you know, you shouldn't be leaving her out here like this. She said she just wanted uh, to get a limo there. And the mother coldly says, oh, she'll be fine. And I'm like, okay. So I go back to Teresa and I say, Teresa, I'm going to go. Uh, my my boyfriend and I only have his truck and we're going to go back and we're going to get the Mercedes. If the limo doesn't come back by then, I will personally drive you home. When I get back, the the uh, the car is there and she rolls down the window. She thanks me. Now, fast forward to now when I'm researching and I find out that my family actually knew and worked with Louis Jolie, they call him Jolly West. And, um, and then I researched a little bit about Teresa Saldana. Then I found out that Steve's mom was on the board of, it was called Victims for Victims. It was Teresa's uh, organization that she established. And I find out that Teresa was in the running as the host for America's Most Wanted. There we are again, Megan and I again. It's a tie that it's like a, it's not just one tie between her and I. It's like a thousand ties that, you know, we could live to be, I'd live to be a hundred and I'd still have information to share with her and she'd still have information to share with me. 
it's a bond that I can't even explain. I mean, I, when she cries, I cry. But that goes back to what Megan was saying earlier, where these same people that you have the connections about, they, they've been doing everything possible during the duration of your lives to make sure that you don't connect with each other and with other people who are victims of these perpetrators that, that you all know of and these systems and all of the, this, this web of deception that has lured in and uh, cultivated so many survivors and so many instances of trafficking and of abuse, you know, they've, they've done everything that they can to keep you apart. And it's so powerful to see that, you know, because I'm sure Penny and, and Megan, you both probably provided puzzle pieces to each other's stories that you wouldn't have had without each other. You know, and every single person that steps up, that's what it is. Like we add, we add these, these connections and we get information and resources to say, oh, that part of my story was missing. I didn't know about it, but you just provided that crucial connection for right. it. My brother was well, also see murdered. how unalone you actually are, you yeah. know, how, how, un, how non-unique you actually are is, is actually, I welcome, I mean, horrifically, well, it's horrific, but you know, that, that is for someone going through it to realize you know, how common that, I mean, it's terrifying in the same respect, but, you know, to come my, together my, and not my only brother, to keep us from each other, but information as well. Right. My brother, David was murdered as well. My brother, David wrote a book, which is unpublished entitled the whistleblower. It was about the Vatican. It was about Bush who uh, Megan's dad knows very well. He knows the Bush family, all of them. He knows Jeb, he knows George Jr. He knew George Sr. He's shaken hands with uh, Barbara. My brother David wrote a book. All the way to Anheuser Busch as well. Yeah. Anheuser Busch as well. Where is Anheuser? Is he in Vero? Yes, it's my dad's best friend. One of my dad's best friends, and that goes into polo and horses and <laughs> cloning and lots of other avenues, selling people on paperwork as livestock. Yeah. I mean, Megan and I, like I said, we could spend the next, you know, 40, 50 years sharing information with one another because the parallels, I, I know that my project was a cloning project. So it's, you know, kind of, and I don't want, you know, I don't want people to be, I found out when I was 58 that I was MK Ultra. I didn't even know that I was MK Ultra. And then when I find out that my family is Joseph Mengele, and when I, when I meet people too, um, if I, if they're in person and I shake their hands, I can tell, you know, who their family members are. But I told Megan, you know, your family knows those Joseph Mangley, your family knows my family. And then we find out that she has uh, connections with the Kruger name. And so I say to her, when she says the Kruger name, I say, Freddy Kruger. And she laughs and I go, no, seriously, this is how I do my thing. And then I look and I find Friedrich Kruger was at um, Ravensbrook where she says, was it your great grandma? My grandmother. She says her grandmother was at Raven's book. Who was involved in adoptions and all of that. Uh, we had a, uh, my, my mom kept quiet for 10, what, not 10 years. What am I talking about? Decades um, about her older brother getting, there's a story about him getting his high school girlfriend pregnant and they adopted the baby out and they made it this grab their chest thing about how, oh, the, her family wanted to do it and forced it. Well, we all know now, like that his family could have easily taken in the child if they wanted to, that he would have had rights to do that if they fought for that. And then I'm told how, or then, then this woman comes out of the woodworks, like, seven to nine years ago at our family reunion saying I'm your cousin and I was put in the system I was adopted out I was horribly abused by my adoptive mother my entire life and she even told me how my mom looked at her at that reunion and said you're not family you're not part of our family and, uh, you know, that's, again, that I started asking questions about my grandmother, who was this chess girl, oh, she's from the war and blah, 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 Adel and poor her, but really she was a covert narcissist. And I can't imagine the abuse that went on in, in that household and family straight from and, Germany. Yes. And so it makes one wonder when she said she was at Ravensbrook, was she actually maybe not a victim, but maybe a perpetrator because Friedrich uh, Kruger, like Freddy Kruger, right? He was uh, one of the top agents for Hitler and it, he uh, looked over the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And Ravensbrück was the worst one uh, for women and children. They did the most experiments and my grandmother was taken 
quote unquote, out of Berlin. She was raised in Berlin and she was taken as a child, the story is, and they actually escaped in the middle of the night while they were being raped by Russian soldiers in the woods. So, I mean, I don't know. And then she's brought back later as as Penny was alluding to. Um, And then the story of her getting here is that she was given, uh, you know, um, money for a plane ticket and was on one of the last planes before Hitler closed the borders, quote unquote, was, you know, the narrative I was always given. So, wow. Delving into that, we see those connections and actually looking at Right. You know, so I'm wondering, they, did that family, did her family, did the Krugers actually know Hitler? Because that is, my mom was one of, she was a Hitler baby. So they had thousands of babies for the Reich. And I don't know how they did them all, but some of them they did in vitro fertilization. Some of them, they just actually had sex with the officers. Uh, they had uh, taken the sperm from the soldiers and then uh, frozen it. Uh, it's my belief also that the egregious acts that they perpetrated during the war were for the facilitation that which the Rockefellers um, and the Rothschilds paid for in eugenics in the 1920s. They supported Hitler. And I believe that, that what they were doing when they were dissecting the bodies or whatever is that they were taking the woman's ovum and then uh, sperm from the men. And then they could use the ovum essentially as a container. So they would, if you watch the boys from Brazil, and that was in the 70s, it was explaining how they did it. So they can go in, they can just essentially empty all the DNA, which is in there, and then put in whatever DNA they want in there. And then uh, with an electric shock, they uh, engender the, the fetus to start growing, and then they can implant it in a person. And that is essentially the cloning procedure in which Mengele wanted to clone the Uber soldiers and anyone that was... Uh, loyal to the Reich, and that meant anyone that was loyal to the Reich. It didn't just mean Germans, it meant people all over the world. And they had camps all over the world, which people don't understand. So there were millions of these hospitals. And, uh, well, which you know, happened this, to me in India right before all of this, yeah. too. I, mean, I, had a fetus, I had a fetus stolen in India by the heirs to global oil and drilling. And they, I woke up in the hospital and the sister-in-law was sitting there on the couch with an envelope of money. And I, 10 years later, realized what had happened to me. And I wrote to them about it and I confronted them about it. And I have screenshots of the, the threats and the reaction that I got from, from realizing it. Um, and, and so it does, it is real. And also what I want to say to the, the German approach and the history that we have within Germany, they were stealing children to Germanize them uh, from Poland and things like that. And what we're not realizing in our current CPS system is it's the same exact thing. Our children are being stolen to be quote unquote Americanized, indoctrinated into this transgender pop culture, um, detachment parenting, which stems back to Hillary Clinton and her mentors um, believing heavily in detachment parenting. And that goes back to dictators and who Penny is the one that says, uh, you know, give me your children for a couple generations and we'll have them all programmed, you know, and, and all of that. So yeah, I just wanted to back up what, what uh, Penny was saying with some real like applicable uh examples for today and 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 also what i've experienced <laughs> horrific threats wow. wait and see what happened what's going to happen to your family like literally months weeks before all of this happened too from across one of the, the things world. one of the things when i was researching uh, this little girl she's from austin her name is um katie groves and Katie Groves is young. She's like in her 20s. And she re- recanted a tale about her life that said she was taken from Austin to Middle Crossing, uh, Texas. It said she called it Uncle Sam's Snuff Factory, which is it's an hour from the Bush Ranch. And also Elon Musk has uh, one of his places out in McLaren, which is eight minutes from that place. So we know that there's tunnels going through there and they're also using the military to transport these children. She tells a horrific story, which parallels everything that I'm saying and what Megan is saying. And I, how are millions of these people having the same, the same story? So she tells a story that she was taken to an underground military base there. They took her over. Them. They were growing children in an other woman. And then also they have what's called an artificial womb. So when my, my twins were taken from me, in uh, 1983, 
Um, they waited till they were viable. I was told if I didn't have this abortion, that the, that his parents, who were the psychologists, and I realize now that they were taking the DNA for my brother, John, because they knew him. I was told if I didn't uh, surrender the children, the twins, that um, his parents would frame me, put drugs on me, throw me in jail for 25 years, and then take the babies and raise them as their own. Then he gave me a money order to go to a place in Newport Beach. It was a Planned Parenthood. By this time, they were viable. So I believe now that they actually took those children, because Clonade is right out there in Riverside, used mm -hmm. an artificial womb and then transplanted them. Now, I can't prove any of this, but I, my feeling, my general feeling is that those children were actually the Duffer brothers because they were born, uh, I was pregnant in May and they were born in February. Um, the, of, so I was pregnant in May of 1983 and they were born in February of 1984. And I knew that I had twins. I knew they had dark hair and blue eyes and the Duffer brothers have dark hair and blue eyes. And I, can I prove any of this? No, but they were also born in Durham, North Carolina. And I found out recently, I was researching, my mother was a nurse, which falls in line with the 11 story about her going. And uh, I don't know if my mother volunteered for it or not, but um, you know, if she was a Hitler baby, which I believe she was, if she, and she's a nurse, is it possible that they actually used her for transplantation or for experimentation for MKUltra? Um, she was gay. She did not not like men. So how did she end up married to my father? And, and how was she getting impregnated? Uh, these are questions that I, I can't answer yet, but I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to find out. So she was also in North Carolina and she was in nursing school. I don't know what nursing school she went to, but is it possible that she had an alliance with Durham, with Duke University? Because I know I was taken there as a child. And that's where the Duffer brothers were born. They were born in Durham, North Carolina. These are not, you know, these are coincidences beyond coincidences. Right. And that's where I lived. I went to school <laughs> and it was under the guise when I applied to all of my different colleges. It was under the guise of, oh my gosh, you're so lucky you got into Elon. So then you feel, oh my gosh, I can't wait to go. Burlington, that's lab core, that's all testing. I have my fiance out of college, then got into Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill for medical school. He was got grant funding for um, stem cell research. Uh, and was also growing skin for in the lab for burn victims um, from, you know, cadavers and different things like that. Um, and he also was my first highly and probably most physically abusive uh, partner that I was supported to be with. Um, and that's another part of it. You know, they praise these guys, they support certain ones and not other ones. And then you're wondering like, oh, I must be, you know, this must be okay, or this must be good, or he's a tape, you know, whatever variable that then, you know, you go under and, and put up with it, but yeah, horribly abusive, the doctor, you know, God complex, you know, that people need to realize about everything we're going through medically today uh, is very real. These doctors definitely, um, and the way that they're trained, that's a whole other tangent, but it's not even any, um, you know, bedside manner anymore. You see this, you do this, you see this, you do this. It's very diagnostic. So that revealed a lot, but that was in research triangle and Durham right there. I worked at the Raleigh Durham arts council and uh you know it's just very again i want to to put that in there because it does all literally you know yeah, down the mangalays the lived the out there thing. too they lived out yeah. um the people that raised me the mangers they lived out in uh in north carolina wow mm -hmm. the connections are just it's really crazy it's it's fascinating and i'm so happy that you guys found each other to be able to supplement that. Cause I think too, that's, there's an internal validation also of knowing that, Hey, there's something that I, that I know that I feel is true, but there's nobody else in my life who is corroborating the same story. Everybody's telling me I'm crazy. Everybody's telling me it's not true, but my memory is my heart, my soul, my, my intuition. Like I know that this happened to me and that it's true. That has to be so nice for you guys, not just with each other, but with other people to have that validation, to know that, okay, I'm not the only one with this connection, or I'm not the only one with this uh, situation that, that I either went through or that I, I suspect happened to me. Um, and Megan, for you, you mentioned, uh, you know, speaking of things that you and Penny may have in common, did you have any Freemasonry or satanic ritual abuse or anything 
anything like that, that you know of that's either been before you or in, in your lifetime in your family? Yeah. I mean, again, it's all usually hidden. And, you know, I think that, you know, not that I'm anything special, but, you know, I have always, and I give thanks and all the credit to my constant connection. That's never wavered to God. It's how I got in all these different air arenas, if you will, on the search of the truth of God and all of that. But, um, you know, yeah. And especially when, when that really started coming into my life, you know, again, the programming and everything, that's another, another show but you know when you're a child you don't recollect a lot of that um and, right. and I will say it's funny I just have this picture right here that Penny knows um and now this is coming up but you know really when I started questioning things or really being confronted about Illuminati and you know all this industry stuff and stuff was again when I was targeted um and taken to Chicago and um that's a whole other thing of how they do traffic people through the industry um, very realistically. And uh, what I saw out there and was put through, um, you know, you're being driven in the, in the agents, you know, car or different things. And I noticed a ring in the door, you know, jingling around. And so of course you're going to pick it up and look at it and say, Oh, it looks nice. You probably don't want to lose this. Here it is. And then having them go, you know, Oh, well, oh, oh, my, my Mason ring. Oh, you know, you must know about that. You know, your dad, John Walsh and Illuminati. And you're like on your way to the recording studio. And so you're like, I literally, this is what happened to me. And I was like, I don't know what, no, I don't know what you're talking about. My dad's a crime fighter. You know, this is like six years ago all this stuff. And, you know, just, you really don't realize it when I'm in the studio with Kanye and he's staring at his one Yeezy sneaker for two and a half hours <laughs> and not looking up. And then he gets up and starts <laughs> ranting around about Taylor Swift. And, you know, I mean, you're like, this is, this is not normal. You know, this is not yeah. normal stuff. And, you know, I went back to Christ and Christianity about two years ago now. And, um, after 20 years in Eastern religion philosophy, like I said, and going into new age and, uh, you know, I didn't start, I, I admit, and the Lord loves me for it. I did not start saying, you know, I'm going back to Jesus Christ. I mean, that was part of it, but really it was being in, and I think a lot of people will come to this at some point. It was really sitting there in my life and going, if Satan was real and I'm supposed to be in his playground, what would he look like? I got to start asking myself. I got to start figuring this out. I started looking these people in the face and even asking that. And the things that I have, you know, I, I don't know how I did half of what I've done or made it through half of what I've made it through. But, you know, literally looking at these people it got to a point with Kanye and his crew where I would be like, you know, OK, what does the devil look like then? Men in suits with contracts? Like, what are we talking about here? Because that's pretty much what it's looking like. <laughs> So that's, that's kind of how I started with that one. And then again, being taken to like Raven Simone parties where it's supposed to be this like after party for the VMAs. And it's like a vacant Airbnb house where they literally looks like they put out, you know, an ad on social media to whatever desperate, you know, LA kid would show up. And I mean, how many left that night? What happened? What was going on there? You know, and, and I would just, I would just get out of Dodge and I thank God for that. But going back to the child programming real quick before we you know, we've been on for a while, but I wanted to show, I was, I was looking the other, a couple of weeks ago, right, Penny, to show mm -hmm. a picture of myself and Drew Barrymore, which I, you know, grew up with playing off and on with and was told is my third cousin or fourth cousin, something like that. And, and the Barrymores are on in my family line. It's John Drew Barrymore was her grandfather. And that's related to my side of the family. Uh, my mom's maiden name is Drew. So I was looking at this. This is us. You know, there's Drew Barrymore and I growing up um, at events and we would play together and different things. But this picture didn't pop up right away. Right, Penny? Right. <laughs> what popped up? So here we go. Speaking of Reagan and everything, here's me, obviously, at the White House. Uh, on a carpeted platform. We can see the carpets down here too. And this is a platform. This is Sally Struthers, who if you look into her, that's again, we won't go into these players, but I encourage everyone research. Don't take our word for any of this research on your own. I want you, when you realize it and when you make your own thoughts, then that becomes your belief. You know that that's truth. I don't want you to take our word for it on any of it guys. So here's Sally Struthers. Who's that right there, ladies? That's Senator Hawkins. That's not um, Nancy. We no, thought it Hawkins was. With it, which is and with, it's weird because she looks like she could be Nancy's double. 
Yes. And they're squeezing some weird toy, Kermit the Frog or something. And I've got keys. I'm in a satin dress. So I also want to say for children programming, I'm in a princess satin dress with a little boy haircut. Okay. So that's part of the whole thing. And then here's my mother. Now, the mo most significant part of this is what's be, I was having flashbacks, right, Penny? Yeah. for months. And I kept saying, you know, people are talking about these tunnels. You know, I get asked all the time, these questions like the tunnels, the satanic blood drinking, the adrenochrome. Well, we can talk about all that in a grounded way. And, and I hope that that's what Penny and I are offering in all of this. You know, that you said something about people calling you crazy and everything. I have to say something to that. I've never been called crazy by anyone except for my family or people doing it. I've never been called crazy, actually. And what I really want us to be able to do, and I think that Penny and I have been able to do is very groundedly, we're not here going crazy, yelling a bunch of, you know, terms and kitschy things that people are learning about that there, there's great avenues for that. There's great channels, there's great everything. And that's wonderful. But we are groundedly and with facts or different proofs and research trying to really lay this out for the masses in a way that is not, this isn't crazy. This is not, you know, it needs to be addressed. So anyways, here's my mother uh, going back and I was having flashbacks saying, you know, people are asking about these tunnels and I don't know about that, but, you know, growing up at the White House, I definitely remember being uh, under the White House and with cinder blocks and, you know, spray painted arrows and directions, you know, to go this way is this way and that way is that way. And, uh, and then I go and by accident pull up this picture while I'm looking for the Drew Barrymore and we look behind my mom and what do we see behind my mom? Looks like a cinder block wall. Yeah. Cinder blocks. Yeah, that doesn't look like a normal room in the White House. No, and there's carpet and platforms and there's suits in the back. We can see people standing around in the back. And cinder blocks. Like, was there not enough room? Like, were all the rooms taken upstairs in the White House? Or, like, what, why were we all down there? What was going on? So, you know, that goes into programming and... Again, I was given a black box of jelly beans and a jar by Reagan and everything when I was small. And again, that goes into all the other. And then parts. Reagan is also tied to the find the founders. Is it finders or founders? Finders, find the finders. The finders cult in which there were sex trafficking children to the White House. And George W. Sr., who was head of the CIA, was at the Naval Observatory. The, and that's where all the VPs stay. So Kamala Harris is staying at the... Uh, the Naval Observatory, which was about four minutes from where the apartment where they located the children, and it was not um, it, where they located where they were selling the children, let me put it that way. And then they also had, uh, they literally had invoices for uh, China and for various places, and they were right down the street from the embassies where Embassy Row is. So it's my proposition that they were literally selling those children uh, through the embassies. And then yes, there were sex traffic the to the White House through the tunnels. The, the, the embassies have a lot to do with it. And people need to look up Holly Days, D-A-Z-E, and the campaign, the adoption campaign under Reagan. Unfortunately, everyone wants to think he was this hero. But if you look at it, that's really where it was put out, an entire campaign for adoptive parents, um, the incentives to adopt these children, how if it didn't work out, it was the child's fault. Um, these children can be irate and animalistic. I mean, it is foul and how they can return. You can return the child if it doesn't work out for you. Um, absolutely horrific things that were. Also, Megan, did your dad work with um, Johnny Gosh's mom? Yes, Noreen Gosh. And that's, you know, we currently have someone in America. I don't know. It's not my job. I wish my dad would get off my kids and worry about his own child. But there is someone in America to this day saying that they are alive and that they are my brother, Adam Walsh, and that Johnny Gosh is also alive, that my mother and Johnny's mother, Noreen Gosh, were behind this. It has to do with adoption, has to do with child trafficking, um, that they were both taken and put into the system, turned out into the system. Their birthdays were changed. Their names were changed. They were experimented on. This person lives as a woman to this day so if anyone wants to 
wonder about all these things, again, I will groundedly give you an example and you can decide for yourself because I'm, I'm just living this with everybody else, honestly. Um, but yes, Johnny Gosh involved in that, that would be again related to finders, you know, and those are the children that were sold to the White House. And Megan is a little infant, you know, and Reagan is holding her in his hands. Reagan was responsible for many dastardly things, including the sale of uh, cocaine through the Iran-Contra uh, uh, scandal. And uh, yet, while he's doing this, while he's perpetrating this, Nancy's out there saying, just say no. Gosh, that is wild. And like you said, I definitely, I think people should go down that rabbit hole because it's, it's like you said, it's all there if you're just looking. Now, Megan, where are you today with your case and how can people support you? Oh, thank you, Emma. Well, horrifically, I have a, a hearing coming up on January 24th. Uh, the department just said that they will be moving to uh, adoption upon the next hearing in April. If I don't comply with them, uh, then, I, then they will be giving my parents guardianship uh, in April and they're going to move to do that over, you know, again, housing. I do not have a house because they took my home and they're holding it in escrow until after the case so that I can, if, I mean, this couldn't be more obvious if you ask me, I guess it's just me, but uh, they're holding an escrow so that I can't get a home, I can't get a car, and I can't get back on my feet to get my children back. So um, the department is moving towards that. Um, I do not have a lawyer. We really, you know, we have all these patriots, quote unquote, we have all these constitutional people, all of this. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that no one will really stand up against John Walsh. I mean, I understand. A lot of people understand why you wouldn't. Um, and that's why they aren't. We know that. But we do need somebody that, you know, this isn't about John Walsh. This isn't even about me. This is about somebody who has the, the technical degrees and ability that we don't have. We have everything else. Um, and that can actually fight for us and set the example of why this, this stuff needs to stop or be addressed that, you know, accountability uh, needs to happen and, and this immunity that these people experience needs to be removed. I mean, this is insane. Um, the, the only government agency that's not audited is CPS and it should be the number one most audited. Um, people that have nothing to hide don't hide anything. So, um, and that goes for my father as well. So my case is there. Uh, we're trying, you know, I'm praying to God that the truth comes through. Um, and we just need people to come together. Any bit of support. I really want people to start speaking amongst each other. I really want people to start going in their community, not on Twitter, not on anything even. I'm going to say that. Go to who is around you and go to the people that you think would doubt you, doubt this the most, you know, like take that challenge on, like find grace and truth and educate yourself and be able to groundedly like this, deliver information, educate people from a place of compassion and understanding that, you know, we have been given a totally different narrative and understanding of what our child protective services is doing. And us as mostly good people by heart don't want to believe that we would never even question it. So the people can really start talking amongst each other start calling your local DCF offices, your district attorney, your, you know, your local representatives and things and start asking them what they're doing about it, if they are aware of this, um, you know, and even rallies or protests just to inform your local public. I mean, we all have different levels of boldness and, uh, and passion about this. So please like get out you know, make a, make a gathering where you can educate people. Um, and that's what we're really working towards. Um, but again, that give, send, go is really helping me to stay afloat. I couldn't do it. Um, with all the expenses, I think we've raised over $10,000 and unfortunately that's, that's running close to dry as well because of everything. So that is the horrible reality that this is going to come down to money for me. Um, so anyone that can really support me and, you know, me being able to get up and do these interviews and really speak out for all of us and for the children who can't, <laughs> getting over a cold. Um, but, you know, that's really a way to, to help. I, I, you know, other than that, 
you know, I, I, I'm a simple person and we like to keep it simple so that we can actually get things done. So I appreciate everyone that's supported me and, and please just get out and start doing things. We've, we've all talked about this for long enough and enough of us know about it to be able to start um, moving past this wall that we're kind of hitting right now as a movement as well. Um, where we need to, you know, we can say, oh, these people aren't listening or, oh, whatever. Well, what's the next step in grace, you know, peacefully doing this again, it's not, we're not attacking people. We're not, you know, doing that, but it, when we should be with the, with what's being done, you know, and, and we're just saying that there's better ways and this needs to be stopped. And if you don't want to talk about it and you don't want to help stop it, especially if you're in an elective, an elected office, then you're part of the problem now at this point. Gosh, that's so powerful. And Megan, I just want to commend you being the daughter of somebody who has, you know, who is so high profile. It's hard for people who don't have that in their family to talk out. And I think you're so brave and so courageous for everybody and everything that you're facing head on and you're coming forth and speaking on behalf of it. Your children are so lucky to have a mother like you. There's so many children that are enslaved in these, uh, in these systems you know, and, and maybe there are barriers to why they can't speak out, but either way, they're not. There's not a lot of parents out on the front lines taking taking the bullets for everybody else's children. And you're one of those pioneers paving the way and giving other people the courage to say, well, if Megan can stand up and talk about this, what's my excuse of what I can't? And I love that you're the one that that's, you know, putting yourself out there and doing that because it's, it's so important for, for people to see somebody like you, a very strong-willed, intelligent, eloquent, amazing woman, so passionate about not just your children, but being a voice for every child and every parent who's going through this. And I just, you know, it's, it inspires me so much. It gives me courage to, to do what I do watching you guys. And I always ask myself that, you know, it's like, gosh, what am I scared of? Like, look what Megan's doing. Look what Penny's doing. Look what Sarah's doing. Look what this person's doing. So I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Like people look up to celebrities I look up to you guys. I think you guys are the real heroes of the world and the, and the real educators and the people that we should all have our eyes and ears on and saying, how can we help you? How can we support you? And most importantly, how can we learn from you? You know, that way we're passing down better patterns and, and we're creating better generations that, that are to come and we're helping prevent it, preventing this from happening from other parents and children. So I just want to thank you for, for pioneering this way because I know it's not easy coming on here coming on any podcast repeatedly reliving the traumas that you've been through and, and explaining this a million times, you know, you're such a warrior to me and, and just such an amazing woman. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. Emma, I, I couldn't thank you enough. And just like you said that, you know, we might put the fire under your butt, but I have to tell you that people like you and, and you have been a main force in this of, of keeping us, you know, doing what we're doing and uh, giving and really wanting to know these things and standing up for us. And, uh, you know, that's, I I've lost everything at this point for the truth and to fight for this cause, including my children, so, you know, I'll get choked up, but I wouldn't change it for the world. And, you know, if there's, if there's a purpose that we're fighting for in this lifetime and, you know, that's what a lot of people feel displaced within internally these days is that lack of purpose and um, that lack of fight. So, you know, if I can help people, you know, realize things in their own lives that, you know, create, you know, this, uh, this applies in a lower trickle down to everybody. So if there's ways that this can, you know, really open people's eyes to improving their own lives and their own communities and their own families, um, and then ultimately, you know, stopping these horrific crimes, uh, you know, being done to us and, and under our, our dollars that we're working for every day. Um, you know, I think that that should give enough people enough for people to get upset about want to do and also be able to realize how, how it can affect uh, their lives and how they can actually improve their own lives, like I said, so I can't thank you enough for this we're, we're we are risking our lives by doing this my children are on the line and like I said I have lost everything um, except for physically you know I, I'm thankful to God that we're still breathing and, and then there are children and much worse you know my children are being abused they're being brainwashed I mean the 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 effects that this will have on them 
you know, I'm very fortunate and very grateful to my healing work before my connection to God and what I've instilled in them, you know, for the years that I had them leading up to this. Thank God for that. But, you know, there are children that as we're talking, even in this time that we have been on, have been removed from their homes, have been raped by their foster parent, uh, have been sold by their parent uh, to a local friend uh, for the evening, you know, and will be taken to their prep school tomorrow. Um, you know, the, it's it's happening and, and in way more horrific ways than even my children are experiencing. So we, I really want people to keep that in mind. Um, and, and, you know, every second that we can fight for this, you know, is a, a second closer to, you know, hundreds of children within that second being abused and, and put through it. So thank you very, very much, Emma. Thank you. It's my honor. I love both of you so much. And I've, I've been talking to you so much, Megan. So it's an honor to finally get you on the show and to get to, you know, share your story. And Penny, I want to thank you for coming on too, being such an ally. You're such a warrior yourself. You're out there fighting for your own story and and you're the backbone for so many others. You know, you're like all of our moms almost. I feel like she's my, I feel like she's my daughter. That's how much I love her. Yeah. yeah. And you, so you're that much. pillar for a lot of people. You've come so far in your own healing to be able to, you know, take on other people's mm-hmm. stories and help them with research and help with these connections. So I just want to thank you both. This is such a fun episode, you know, a hard topic, but it's, there's not two better people in this whole world to bring awareness to this than, than both of you. And I, I really believe with all my heart that you guys are going to have, and you are having a tremendous impact on the world. Now, where can people connect with both of you? Um, I'll connect all of it in the show notes. I know we gave your website and your donation site. I will definitely put that below. Where else are you guys on social media? So I can tag all of that below and people listening can go connect with you right now. Okay. Well, mine's quick. So I'm going to let Penny go after me. Mine's quick. Mine's just Twitter, Megan Walsh underscore M-E-G-H-A-N. W-A-L-S-H underscore on Twitter. Um, If you can't message me, uh, just leave a comment that you want to reach out to me on one of my posts and and we'll be in touch. Please give me patience though, because we've got a lot going on, but I have been getting, you know, within a couple of days, uh, as Emma knows, at least uh, back to everybody. So Penny, take it away, Miss Pioneer. (laughs) What what is your, um, Megan, what's your website? Uh, again, that's the wellness mercantile. Can you spell that? Um, so M E R C H A N T I L E, merchant aisle, if you will. So the <laughs> wellness mercantile.com. <laughs> Uh, there's no pickles on my site. <laughs> right. See, that's why, that's why I said that because when we're on Dave's show, he pulled up this thing and Dave and I were both going, wow, you sell pickles? I'll buy some of those. He's like, no, that's not my site. <laughs> and also, if you guys let me know, you know, I, I mentioned workshops and stuff. I'm more than happy if people, if there's enough interest to do a workshop on breaking down, you know, different aspects of the industry, of these topics, of MK Ultra, of, you know, um, you know, many different things. Um, I'm going to pick your brain, Emma, later. So everyone knows about, you know, getting on podcast or creating my own podcast eventually and, and doing all that. But I've, again, been this mom, healer, farmer. So I, you guys bear with me. Um, but again, lastly, I guess, since Penny's pulled it out of me, the give, send, go as well. Give, send, go uh, backslash Megan Walsh. So, and I, I just appreciate all of it. Go ahead, Penny. Okay. So for me, you can find me on, I'm everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Penny L.A. Shepherd. You can find me on IG under Shepherd Out. Um, I have a couple of IG accounts and then also on Twitter, Shepherd Out. I have one that's Agent X11. Um, I'm on MeWe. I'm on uh, Telegram. I have a group on Telegram. I have a group on, um, I always forget the name of that, Signal. <laughs> I'm on Telegram and Signal with two groups. I'm on Facebook. I have, I run two MK Ultra groups between the two of them. There's about 5,000 people that are in there. They're research groups. So they're primarily, I don't, I try not to interfere with any, anything that people post unless they post something that Facebook says is uh, fake and then I get a strike against me, unfortunately. Um, but uh, so two groups on there on IG and also my blog is Shepherd, S-H-E-P-A-R-D and the word entertainment 
www.blogspot.com. It's more updated than my website. This is a little more difficult to, since I built the website, it's a little bit more difficult to edit it. And that's shepherd and then a hyphen, which is a little dash, and then the word entertainment. Um, dot com and then also my email is shepherd entertainment uh, dot com, at gmail.com and many people when I first started this are like well why do you have an entertainment company well I was in entertainment my whole life and I always had a, a second uh, company that I had that I would DBA this isn't even DBA I'm not making any money I'm not asking anybody for anything and uh, when I prayed and I asked God I had uh, a guy his name is Alan Gresick and uh in Chicago uh, that asked me to be his manager. He is an orchestra leader. And uh, I asked God, what should I call this company? And God said, they call it Shepherd Entertainment Endeavors. And I was like, oh, I like that. The acronym is C. And then when I went back to say Durrells, who is in Lake Havasu, who is the son of Albert Spears, um, I was researching my brother, John, further. And I found that he brokered a deal for the Crystal Cathedral, which was for the Orange Diocese, which led to the Vatican, which they call the Holy See, which is actually the unholy see. And then I said, oh, I see, right? And then I said, did I literally sleep with Satan because I slept with my brother, but I didn't know that he was my brother at the time. He was my agent. And I found out from my first husband in 2017 that John was not only just my agent, but he was my brother. So there's that. And you guys, Penny did an incredible episode with me a couple episodes back. I'm also going to add that in the show notes. That way you guys can either go back in my archive or just click on it and, and hear Penny's story. It's absolutely incredible. Um, the best way you guys can support them is by following them on social media and by sharing their content, including this episode. Again, the algorithms don't favor our voices. So we need your help to get them in front of more people and sharing is the best way to do that because it's not gonna come up organically on a lot of these search engines, um, if at all. Um, and I think people like Penny and uh, Megan are probably even shadow banned. So it's hard to even type their names in. So please share their content, uh, share this interview. Uh, ladies, I'm so honored that you guys came on today. This was a treat and you guys both have such big voices and big purposes. And I can't wait to see what God does with them. Um, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Follow us, subscribe again, share, 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 and we will see you guys next week.